Hello, this is Patrick Paulson at QNAV Software, and this is our weekly webinar for Thursday, April 19th, 2012. Today I'm talking about data-driven design. Um, this is not something that is often talked about, but it's a very important best practice for creating scalable InfoPath solutions. Um, for those of you who attended the webinar, uh, this was the schedule, and uh, we are going to go a little bit over with the video recording. Uh, we uh, we didn't have a chance to do a good recording during the webinar, so I'm doing this separate from the webinar, and this should be about a 30-minute recording. So today we'll talk about what data-driven design is, um, why it's, it's important for you to know about it. The four techniques I'm going to describe um, when I come with demos. I'll show you how to create a data-driven form uh, to do quizzes, also to add multilingual support to your forms, uh, and then we'll talk about a couple other data-driven techniques, one using um, extensions to InfoPath, how to do data-driven code design, and finally, uh, how to use web services in a data-driven way. So first off, the number one pitfall of InfoPath is, is the data source. Um, data source in InfoPath is this, uh, uh, let me just show you a quick example here. It is um, this, uh, on the right here, you see the, the fields uh, tab, the fields task pane. This uh, is the data source, right? And this corresponds to your form. Now, I want to show you one form that is not so well described first. This one uh, is, a, is also a survey form. And this shows on the right a data source which has three questions in it. And this is an example of of the reason of, of a bad, badly designed data source. Um, but a lot of times people will uh, create an InfoPath form and they will just add controls here from the, the ribbon. And when they do that, InfoPath is going to just name them with field one, field two, field three. And then if you have a group, it'll be group one, group two, group three. And many times uh, users don't actually change the names. They'll create a nice form, it looks really well. Um, but but then it, it has this data source, which is, for all intents and purposes, uh, unusable for reporting. Now, you can use it for data capture, and people do. Uh, but the problem is that once you go to, uh, you've got a thousand forms in InfoPath you know, over the year, you, you've deployed your form, you know, you've collected a thousand different survey answers or quiz, quiz answers, and... Uh, and now you want to do something with it, reporting on it. And with, with fields that are named field one, field two, field three, groups, group one, group two, group three, it's going to be very difficult to do reporting on that. Um, so that's the typical, the, the, the number one pitfall is people don't think about their data source when they're designing their form. Now this form also shows a, a bad data source design. It has hard coded the number of questions. We have three questions for the survey. And if you want to extend the questions or change the questions, um, you have to change the schema. You're creating a separate InfoPath form, and that, and that requires more work. Um, so I'll be talking about that. Uh, I'll also be talking about, like I said, labels, making labels uh, that are not limited to English, multi-language support. And then the third, the third topic again today is going to be um, when you extend your form using code, how do you do it in a way that is uh, not form-specific, in other words, using a piece of code, reusing the code over and over again. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about the web services and how you do that in the data-driven design. And I kind of think of this uh, whole analogy here of data-driven pro business process design as using bits, drill bits. If you're, if you're a, master, a master cabinet maker or you're uh, somebody who, who makes uh, um, furniture, for example, or whatever house, um, a carpenter, you, you have lots of different uh, tools in your toolbox. And uh, similarly, if you create a form that is data-driven, you can use that form over and over again to solve many problems. The number one benefit of a data-driven design is that you have to do, you can do less work. So you can get more done faster and with less work, which means, um, and the reason why is because you re you're reusing one form template for many different processes. Or you're you are using one form template for different languages. Um, you're not having to recreate a form uh, every time you create a, uh, a business process. You can reuse an existing form. 
In addition, when things change, it's easy to accommodate them. You don't have to re redo the form in such a way that will break a previously entered data. The schema, if the data source is flexible, it can handle old data as well as new data, and it won't it won't cause problems for those forms that have been entered before. With the um, with the badly designed data source here, uh, let's say we add a couple. Um, let's say we change the schema. So the data source is hard coded to three questions here, and let's say we change these to make it uh, five questions or so forth. Now the old old forms will still open as long as we're only adding data. But if we change the data source, for example, imagine for a moment that you have a data source which has field one, field two, field three, and so forth. Um, you're going to want to change that to make those those field names indicative of what they're actually holding, the data that's actually in the field. For example, you know, using regular names like user, date, time, things like that. When you make that change to a form, if you have old data that was entered with the field one, field two, group one, group two, then that data um, won't open in the new form, and that requires quite a bit of change management costs to uh, support different versions. Um, and you don't have to do that if the form has been designed correctly from the from the get go. In addition, with the data driven design, your reports uh, will be consistent, so you don't have to you don't have multiple info path forms. So you don't have to have multiple reports. You can have separate. You can have one report for for all of your forms, and that's because the schema, the data source, is the same for those. And finally, when you make a change uh, to your form, you don't necessarily need to bring the system down. You can just publish over the existing one, um, and so there's no downtime experience by your users, and that's that's going to save you money as well. So that's the, really the. the the reason the why and the wherefore here is about is about saving time and saving money. So let's talk about this this first example here. Um, now, for a lot of forms, uh, a lot of forms have this common questions, you know, format. In other words, um, pretty much every organization today has a need for a survey form or a checklist form or a quiz or a questionnaire. They need to get feedback from their users. Now, these types of forms can be very nicely. Um, Normalized, they can be. They can. Be, you can create a, a very nice, nicely normalized data source here that that will handle all all versions of your surveys, all versions of your quiz forms. We're going to show you how to do that here in a second. But before we do that, let's just go over this quickly. What happens here um, when questions change is um, with with typical forms. Um, if you um, if you have a hard coded schema like you saw with the previous example here, three questions. If I change those questions, the old data, of course, won't be valid because the questions will be different. Um, you could do a side-by-side -side content types and so forth, but it's more costly. And so rather than you know, create this, this proliferation of, of XML template parts, these sort of XML form templates, you know, these XSN files, rather than create a bunch of info path forms, create one form. One form handles all the variance and is data-driven. And that's the technique here, is to use a, a more generic data source. The is a classroom quiz. You're a high school teacher. Um, you're at a high school has about 500 students, about 25 teachers or so, and those teachers every Friday do a quiz for their students, and that quiz um, is an InfoPath form. And they want to ask you know, 10 questions on the Friday just to make sure the students are paying attention, and it's an important part of their grade. So you've created an XML, XML form, InfoPath form, and you've been distributing it to your class, and all the other teachers are doing the same thing. Well, if you do it every Friday, and there's 25 or 30 Fridays in the year, um, there's 20 teachers in the school, 25 teachers. You have a lot of forms. You have you know, 600 plus form templates potentially, and that's a huge number to manage. Not only that, but you cannot report on all those forms. You can't aggregate the results. Um, you can't get statistics easily uh, across the different quizzes, um, and so you have a very difficult situation. So what we're going to do is talk about um, how to how to uh, um, create one form that you can use for all the teachers, for all the quizzes, and therefore you, you, you can aggregate the results, get the statistics correctly calculated. Um, 
And it all revolves around pre-populating the data. Instead of having the questions hard-coded in the form, you're going to pull the questions in from a secondary data source. Now, you know, pre-populating data is important not just for data-driven design, but it's also important to reduce the time it takes your users to fill out the form. So it's a, just a, generally, it's a good practice. And um, so the first place you want to start here with the, with, well, when you're pre-populating data, um, the other reasons to do it are to um, help the user fill out the form more quickly. Obviously, you're going to be controlling which values they can choose. Um, in the case of a quiz, you're controlling the questions that are asked. You want to control, um, and it, it, you can use it, obviously, to do the state of design here. That's the, the fifth bullet here. Um, so let's take a look at um, ways to pre-populate data, specifically looking at the data-driven design example. And I'm going to talk about default data and show you how that works here with uh, this form. Now, Here's an example, um, let me just get the right one here. I've got a bunch of forms we're going to show you today, and I want to make sure I'm on the right one. Here it is. So rather than use the presentation survey form that you saw, it has the hard-coded data source here. And we've chosen to normalize data source and have um, a set of questions that are repeating underneath set of surveys that are repeating. And therefore, there can, there can be any number of questions. It's not limited to three. And the questions here, um, you can see that the question text is actually in, in the data source. You say, well, that's not a good practice because I can't change it. Well, that's actually not true because in this case, we've, we've decided to pull the question text from a secondary data source. So even though the question text is in the main data source, it doesn't have to be. Um, but we've added it. Um, we've added a rule here. Uh, actually, what we've done is we've, we've started off with default data. And very, this is a great place to start because it forces you to think in a data-driven design. So what I've done here is I've just added default data to the form. So I've just added that first quiz to my form, and you can see here that I've got, um, I've got a survey name, um, I've got question text, answer text, and I'm going to be filling this in um, to basically uh, correspond to that first quiz. And this is the starting point. This is not what you're going to end up with at the end, but it's a great way to start because it forces you to create a data source that is uh, that is data driven. So let's take a look at what it, what um, what the form looks like when we're done, um, and then we'll uh, we've got labs for for all these examples. We'll be sending out. Um, you'll have a link on the YouTube page to, to get to this, um, so you can you can go through lab one and and do the exercises and see how we did this. When you're done with the exercises, what you'll see is that that default data here, um, now instead of having blank data for the survey name, we have a bunch of silly questions here, silly surveys. We've got one, we're doing a movie review for the first one on the beach, an old, old Australian movie, filmed in Australia, uh, Melbourne, I think. Um, and the default data then is going to have a bunch of questions. So we're going to say, well, what did you like about the movie? Um, uh, and uh, what didn't you like, and so on, right? So we've got these four questions here. And you can see that we've just filled these questions out, it's default data out, in the default data um, dialog here. And then, then the second question um, is, uh, so the second survey is, is going to be uh, the, uh, the Mac Cafe restaurant review. So we've uh, decided to go to McDonald's and write a review. Um, and uh, so we've got three questions there. What's the new burger? Um, what's in it? And what was it cost? And for finally, for our third survey, we have a massage review, and we have here a bunch of questions as well. So in this uh, in this sample, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a question here. In fact, let me add a question to the uh, let me add a survey actually. You see, it's all default data, and the way you add new default data is you just highlight the uh, row, you just add another survey below it, and then here we're going to call this. The, uh, oh, let's see, we'll call it um, a review for, uh, let's see here, what are we going to do? The, um, the Seattle, actually, we're going to call it the <laughs> Kiabra webinar, weekly webinar review. Okay, um, and uh, that's the name of our survey. Now, don't click OK. If you click OK, the dialog will go away. Um, so that's one of the kind of gotchas here when you're entering default data is you just have to go in here and it's going to automatically copy the default data from the previous survey. So we'll put in another question here and this is going to be, um, you know, was the presentation clear? And uh, then we'll have a, another question for um, um, you know, the presenter. Um, uh, 
questions. Do you know this? Like that. And then we'll, have another, well, we'll do three questions and we'll delete the third and fourth one. Would you recommend it? How long was it? I've got my, my three questions. I've just added these new questions. I'm going to delete the fourth question here, the default value. And now let's take a look at what this shows in the preview. If you preview the form now, you've got these four surveys. And if we go to the fourth one, it's going to just show us. Um, actually, it's, it's got um, a bunch of different questions in here. It's actually I got uh, the massage questions as well. So we need to fix the form to filter out uh, just those questions. And um, what I think the, the problem here is that when I added the default data, I didn't uh, set the, the ID correctly for the survey. So we need to just change that survey number to four, and that should do it. And now if we preview it, you'll see that um, we only get those three questions that are for the, for the weekly webinars review. And of course, we've got the other reviews. We can switch to them. So we've got a survey form now that has a default data in it. And um, it has a schema that is very uh, data-driven and it's very flexible, so it can handle any set of surveys. Okay, now, that's the first step. And once again, the reason why we're doing this is to force us to use a good data source design. Um, so if we take a look at default data here a little more in depth, um, you know, we've got this old, this, on, the, on the left here you see this badly designed data source with a hard-coded number of questions, um, modules. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to use the default data to force ourselves to add those question tech data into the default data. And as, when we do that, it's going to force us to create a data source which is more um, more, more uh, data-driven. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the next step. Now, the next step after this, the default data is to use uh, to move the data outside the form because you're, you're thinking to yourself, of course, okay, Patrick, that's fine, but um, uh, but I don't want to have to go through and add all my data to default data, and moreover, um, whenever I change the data, I have to republish my form, and, and that's so good. And I agree that, that that's not, you know, the default data is not the end goal here; it's just the the, the key expedient to forcing yourself to think in a data-driven way. So default data is just the first step. And then the next thing you want to do after that is you want to actually um, publish the data um, to a secondary data source and pull the questions in from that. So how do you do that? Well, the easiest thing to do is just to preview the form like you just saw me do here, and then to save it um, as XML. Now you can see here that um, we don't have the save option here in the form because um, the form has disabled those. So we need to make sure that, that the form uh, is savable. So we'll go in and we'll add those, those save options here and preview it again. And now I've got uh, the ability to save the form. And I'm going to save the XML form out there as just, uh, uh, we'll call it uh, config um, survey questions or quiz questions. Now, when I save the quiz questions, uh, I can close the preview for the quiz, um, the quiz form, and I can go out to my where I saved it. You can see here that I have a new XML file at the top. This is just contains all the data from the preview. If I open this up in Notepad, you can see the data, the questions, including the questions for the fourth survey down below. Okay. So um, what I want to do next is I'm going to use that information to create an InfoPath form. And what I'm going to do is, is just open up the designer. The designer has an option here to create a form from an XML data. And we will specify that, that quiz questions XML. Oops, not that one. It's probably the same file, but similar, similar file. And we just go through this dialog here and we create the form. And what we end up with is a form that has a data source that looks exactly the same as, as the form that we previewed it from which is the whole goal here, is that we want to uh, just create a form that's going to allow us to edit the data. And, and here I've done that. So I've just created an InfoPath form. Now when I preview it, it's going to show me all the config data. And I can go down here and I can add another question here to, uh, to survey number four. And that's going to be, um, was the presentation worth it? Okay. Uh, we'll save this out. I'm just going to save it. I'm just going to save it over the quiz questions from before. 
Okay. And now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go into my form. And I'm going to, so this is the form that I started from. And I'm going to be adding the config file to it as a secondary data source. So I've got um, a form that I've, I've readied for you. So we just skip to it. I have to go through all the steps necessarily. Um, and uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Okay, so here's a form, and I've added a data connection to that config data. Now, just to show you that I'm going to use the quiz questions that I I picked. Okay, I'm just basically what we've done here is we've added the the data as a secondary XML file, and we've changed the uh, data source to automatically populate from that secondary data source. So if I if you look at my, my drop down now, before um, I just had the values pulling from the main data source, uh, the default data. But now what I've done is I've changed the, the drop down to pull from that secondary config data source. You can see how I did that. In addition, instead of having the default data, I'm using uh, the question text is actually pulling from the secondary data source. So I have an expression here where I've specified the secondary data source question text and I've filtered it on the question number as well as the survey number. Okay, so let's take a look at what this shows in the preview. It's very easy to do that. Like I said, all the steps are in the lab. So I've got my questions here and there's my fourth question. And it's not showing up the, uh, the questions. That's because obviously we need to fix it, um, to fix the, uh, the data so that it's working. Um, and this is actually a, a good time to talk about. So this is the second stage is you, you've taken the default data and you moved it to an XML config file. Now you still need to use the default data um, as your as your slots. In other words, you need to have space in your main data source so that you can automatically copy these questions in. And if you only have three surveys, it's only going to copy three surveys in. So we have to add a fourth survey here. And now if we preview it, um, we should see the questions show up for the webinar review. Okay, now that, that actually brings up an interesting uh, limitation of the default data approach um, is that you do need to have rows in your main data source. When you're copying from a secondary data source, um, you cannot create rows in your main data source um, unless you add an extension. I'll show you in a second how you can do that, um, but that's, that's really, um, it's very easy to do it um, using a uh, this extension library that we have, QRules. And, uh, but you can also do it this way. You can also just have like 100 different rows pre-configured um, in your uh, d default data. Okay, so I am going to go to the next uh, part of the presentation here. So we just showed you how to create default data forces that data-driven design. And We've changed that default data now. We've exported it as an XML config file, which we loaded into the form. And it now exists in the form as a separate file. And uh, we showed how to um, do that, config it. Once again, the, the, for details, you can look at the lab. But now the next step you're going to want to do is move it from uh, config data from inside your form to something that's external to your form. Let's take a look at that real quick here. So I have another form here. Um, now, keep in mind that this is a, a two-part solution here. Um, so we have the form that fills out the form, right? And then we also have the form that configures the questions. And both of these templates are important. You need to be able to edit the questions, edit the surveys, and you need to be able to fill out the form. So we've created a separate form to edit the questions. Now you can say, well, you know, I've got... 25 teachers here at the high school, and they can't all use the same form. They know they're going to be, you know, it's going to be a problem. They're going to have to wait until someone's done with it and edit it. And I agree that, you know, this is just the second stage. Where you really want to go with this is a SharePoint list or a SQL database or something where people can edit their surveys, publish them out there, and not have to uh, have one, one form for editing all the questions. Um, so that's the next step. So let's take a look at how we move this to. Um, to the, the SharePoint site. I've got, um, let's see if we can find the right, um, the right info path form here. 
Okay, that must be it right there. Okay, so this is lab three. So the, the third step here is to take the form and move it to a SharePoint site. Now, I've got a SharePoint site already here open, and I basically published that XML form, the survey editor form, out here um, as a separate file, as a separate form library. And this is just my quiz editing form. And when I open this, you'll see that I've just got a bunch of questions in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload... Um, the quiz questions that you just uh, we just created. Um, you can see that this uh, this survey this survey form has four questions, or four surveys, and the fourth one is the Yellow Cab Restaurant Review. So rather than use that, what we're going to do is we're going to upload another questionnaire here, and I'm just going to uh, go into the library documents and upload that quiz questions I created. The schema should be the same, so we shouldn't have to worry about the fact that we uh, created a separate template for it, the template should still work. And we'll just specify the um, quiz questions from that we just saved. Okay, there it is. Okay, now, um, now if we go edit this, we're going to add another question here. Um, yeah, it's opening in the uh, in the filler. Um, to prevent this from happening, what we're going to do is we're going to go in here to the library and we're going to relink the form. The form was designed locally, um, so we need to relink it to make sure it's we're just going to use this. Uh, so we can relink it to use the um, the template that's stored on the SharePoint site. Okay, now we should be able to open it on the SharePoint site. There it is. You can see here the fourth the fourth survey is the Weekly webinar review. I'm going to add a question here. That's going to be um, uh, Did the um, content, uh, was the content useful? Do you think you will download the content? Something like that. And then we'll submit it. Um, we have a submit button in this form that we uploaded to. Um, just submit it there if you want. That's fine. Make sure that that change took place. We'll just open it up again. There's the question. Okay, so we just edited the config file. Now, um, now what you want to do is, is specify, instead of having the config file stored locally, we're going to point it at that, um, at that file on the, on the web there. And um, what, the, what this is going to do for us is it's going to allow us to update the questions without having to republish the form. And um, we should be able to specify, just grab quiz questions there. As long as the name of the, um, so here, here's a key dialog here to access the data from the SharePoint site. And we, as long as the connection name is the same, um, it, it won't have to, we won't have to update any of the rules in the form to use it. So now when we preview, uh, you'll see that it's going to go out to the website. And before I do that, let me just uh, make one change here to the form first. I need to make sure that, that default data has enough question slots in there for the uh, fifth question. Once again, we'll show you in a second how to, uh, how to use this technique without having to have uh, default data rows for, for every single question that's going to be coming in. Um, but it's easy to add those enough. It's not like we're typing them into default data. The questions really are not in default data. They're in the separate config file. But the default data is needed if you're going to copy them and unload without using the extensions. Okay, so let's take a look at what this uh, shows in the preview. Once again, it's connecting to that SharePoint site, so we're going to get that pop-up while we preview it. Going out there, it's going to pull that form in. It's going to have, there's our weekly webinar review, and lo and behold, we only have four questions. Well, why is that? Well, it's probably because we did not give the survey number for the, for the question. Let's just see here. We've got five questions. That looks good. Um, let's just take a look at the... Uh, there is a survey number, um, which I'm guessing is not... It is possible that we did not edit the survey number correctly here. There's a question number. There's a survey number. That doesn't make any difference. Five questions, that should be fine. Question number is five. So it's pulling it in. And uh, go back to our default data again, because that's where we might see this issue. 
One, two, three, four, five, that's five. You have five. No, hold on a second. There's the issue. You have five surveys instead of four. What I, what I forgot to do was add this, this fifth question here. But once again, this, we can work around this, this little limitation, um, but, but it's easy to uh, just add another row for now for this example. So this is a lab three in the, uh, the content that you're getting as part of this webinar. And um, there we go. So there's the fifth question there. And once again, it's pulling it from the web. So I can go to the web and make a change to it. These, um, what's the meaning of life, for example? We can say here, pull um, meaning of life. OK, just do that, submit it, and open the form again. Well, it's going to have not published the form. I'm just going to preview it again locally. And you'll see that, indeed, the questions are dynamically getting um, pulled in from the, you know, not the case. I guess it did not save it correctly. Let's take a look at this again here. This is a submit button. It's not working with my example. I apologize, but we'll just save it here and close it and make sure that it did get saved. Okay, so there it is, correctly saved now. And now if I preview it, we have the correct question. Okay, so that, that's an example of this third technique of moving the data. First technique is you start with default data that forces you to create the great the nice data source, the data-driven design. You move the default data into a config file and then you move the config file into SharePoint, and that's step four. Now step five would be take the config file and break it up into a SharePoint list so you can have separate rows for every, for every survey or separate rows for every question. Then you have two lists, one list of surveys, one list of questions. And then you pull that data into the form on load and use it to fill that form. In this case, we've just shown you the first three steps. If you're interested in the fourth and the fifth steps of taking the data and decentralizing it even further, um, to make it part of your um, new SharePoint list architecture or even a database, um, then please do contact us. We do have a good training class that includes those extra extra steps, point five. So I've just shown you how to do that data-driven data source with those three different labs. Once again, you can go through those labs on your own. Let's take a look at the next example here. This is a little bit quicker. Now I've got um, an InfoPath form here that um, that doesn't look like anything. You can see here this form. Um, I mean, what is this form? Well, if we look at the data source, you can see that we've named this form expense report, so that must have something to do with expenses, but we don't know. Let's preview it. Oh, that looks a lot better. Well, that's really interesting. That labels don't show up when I'm in design mode, but when I preview it, all those data comes in. And I've got this little drop down here that has three languages, English, Japanese, Nihongo, and Spanish. I select Spanish, lo and behold, all the labels are changed just miraculously there. So what have we done to enable that? Um, so once again, um, the key thing here is that you don't want to use separate views for every language. Why is that? Well, because if you use separate views, you're going to have increased maintenance costs. Every time the form changes, you have to update all those views. And if you have to add a language, you have to add a view and you have to republish the form. Rather than do this, um, I recommend using a language file, in other words, a data-driven design. But instead of using a data-driven design to fill out a survey question, this time you're pulling the data in from a secondary data source where you're editing the labels in the form. So it's pretty easy to do this. Um, you just put all that language stuff in a secondary config file with language IDs and IDs for the labels and then the strings, the actual language text that you're going to use. And then in the form, what you do is you use calculated values. So you can see here that each one of these labels is actually a calculated value. And these calculated values point to a location in that secondary data source. In this case, it's pulling in the report date, and it's filtering it based on the language. In fact, it's filtering it based on the currently selected language. Okay, now, you may say, well, Patrick, you know, this is ridiculous. You've uh, hard-coded the report date. Well, yes, we have. We've, we've actually said that this label will only be the report date. Um, you can make it even more data-driven um, with an ID for the label instead of the actual name. But I don't think it's necessary in this case. In this case, um, the 
the form isn't going to change that often. And when it does, you can certainly add a new label without much, much work. Um, so you just you don't need to make, make it even more data driven. Um, having the language in a second a separate file is the key thing here. And you can see even the buttons uh, can have a calculated value for the label. In this case, the submit button has this uh, label, which is once again selected based on the language. Okay, now um, how do we do this? Well, we have a secondary data source. And that data connection is expense report localization. It's an XML file. Once again, this could live on SharePoint. And I have another file here, uh, if I can find it, that edits the languages. So I've got my, like I, we, we just showed you, we've got you know, a two, a two form template approach to data driven design for quizzes, surveys, checklists, like those kinds of forms. We also have a two form design for our multi -lang multiple, multiple languages. In other words, one of the forms is going to specify the strings. The other form is going to pull the data in. Here we've got these three languages here. If I select one of these, you can see I can, you know, I've got all these languages here. Now I can, uh, um, of course, um, change the text and, and push it out there as a separate XML file. But this, this form allows me to edit the questions. I can add new questions. I can add new languages. I can change the, the labels for that language. Um, you can see that for Japanese, of course, um, it looks quite a bit different using, obviously, Chinese characters and so forth uh, for these different languages, these different strings, um, as opposed to English and Spanish. For those people who speak Spanish, there it is. You can see here that um, you can do, you know, kind of a different, you can have a, a structured approach to where you can have values and, and display name. In other words, you don't necessarily need to um, have it all flat at one level. You can actually have some structure here. Uh, okay, so that's the basic technique. Um, the XML file that's, that's published, let me just show you what that looks like real quick. Um, in Notepad, if we open it up, you'll see that uh, we have a very hard to read file here, but if you look closely, um, for example, you can see that um, that we have uh, Japanese, English, and uh, and Spanish, and it's all kind of glommed together, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But um, but it, you can see that this has all the data in it. Um, so if I were to go in here, for example, in the English case, and look for the report date and change that text after it to Instead of saying report date, I'm just going to say report date, and I'll put date, I'll put in capitalization, same text. We'll just save it out like that. Now, if I go back to my form, and if I change this data connection, just modify it like we did in the previous example, and just browse to the location of the uh, that file that we just added in. Now, normally you wouldn't edit it in Notepad, you'd edit it using the config file. Um, uh, but I'm just, for, for expediency, I'm just going to do it this way. And now you can see that with English, um, the report date is in capitalization. So, very easy to change languages without republishing your, your base form. So that's the third technique. Both languages. Okay. Um, and you saw how we did that. Um, localized expense report by changing all the labels to calculated values and then using a secondary config file to specify the labels for those different languages. Now the third example is with code extensions. And there are times when you need to extend your InfoPath form. For example, if you want to insert a row into a table, you can't do that just out of the box with InfoPath. In fact, we have a sample that we blogged. I blogged this back in September. And this is a sample of a form, which a bunch, a bunch of instructions in it. Basically, it shows you how to copy repeating data from an external secondary data source into your main data source. There's two techniques. The first one uses um, the default values. In other words, it requires that you have slots, rows in your table. Uh, you have to have at least three rows. And you can copy this data that's in the secondary data source. And for the purpose of this demo, I've just got, um, I've got a table with uh, three values, A, B, and C, and it's got three different rows in the table. 
and that's my secondary data source. And I want to copy it into my main data source, which has the same structure, three different values. Um, now I've got five default rows in here, so when I copy this in, it should work just fine. But if I delete all the rows and try to copy it in, it's not going to work. If I just have one row, um, it only copies the first row. Um, so the problem with the out-of-box um, support is that it allows you to copy data from a secondary data source into your main data source, but only if that main data source has those rows pre-created. Now you saw how we did that pre-creation of the rows. What you do is you just go into the default values. You can see here in our default values for this sample form, we have one, two, three, we have five different rows. If we, if we delete one of these, um, and I preview the form now, you can see that it has four rows instead of five. One, two, three, four, which is still enough to handle the three rows that we're copying, and that'll work fine. Um, okay, so, but, but there are many times when you have a, a form and you don't want to have to have 100 blank rows or 200 blank rows or whatever, so you want a way to insert the rows and insert only the number of rows that you need for that, for that specific copy. And to do that requires a little bit of code, or you can use our Q rules library. And that's really the, the key the key takeaway here of this third example is that if you're going to write code in your form, you're going to have to have a developer maintain it. And that's going to cost you money right there. But the developer is probably not going to be thinking in a data-driven design. They're, you know, they're going to be just, okay, I've got this one thing I need to do. I need to finish it by Friday. I need to get it done. So they're going to hard code those XML paths from your input path form into the code. What's an XML path? Well, if you look at this data source here on the right, for our, our copy repeating example. If I right click on my data source, you can see I've got um, a, this copy XPath option. And that lets me copy the, the uh, path to the node in the XML data source. And so if I look at the, what's in note, this in the clipboard here, just copy that in, that is the XPath for that first field. Okay, so what your developer is probably going to do, we see this often, is they will go in and they will create some code that inserts the rows into this item field. And that's going to work fine when the data source has items and item in it. In other words, when it matches the data source that you see right here. But if it's some other form, it won't work. And that's really the crux here, that really the reason why we're suggesting don't do that, because you know, you're, you're going to have separate versions um, of, of code for every single input path form template that you have. Right? And that's going to be a huge maintenance nightmare. So rather than do that, what you should do is you should create one version uh, for all forms. And that is a, a library um, that is XPath agnostic, it's XPath independent. Now we have a uh, few rules, a common library that does that for you, and we have about 80 features in it. We always add new features every, every quarter. Some of you may already have Q rules. Thank you for purchasing it. Uh, or, and the Q rules, basically, the way you access it is you use um, a command. So you use a, um, you use a rule. And what we do with Q rules, this is the second option in this sample, is um, in, in order to preview it. Um, well, before I preview it, let me just show you that we're going to click on this button. And the button has, uh, has a rule on it. So if we look at the rules here, you can see that I've got um, first command here, well, one of the commands is going to be to um, set the value of command, which is a secondary data source. And QRules Q is a, adds a secondary data source to your form with th these values in it. One of the values is command. So the way you access the logic in QRules is you simply set that value to do what you want it to do. In this case, we're going to insert and we've used the concat function because we want to insert the number of rows, but we want to count exactly how many rows we have in that secondary data source and only insert that number. Okay, so what this does here is that each command then passes the XPath into it. And this is what makes it um, form, uh, form independent, is that you can add curals to a form, and all you have to do is just change the rule. All right, so the code doesn't change. Just the instructions to the code that you pass these instructions when you set that value, those instructions will change based on the, the uh, X path in your form, but it makes it much more data driven. Okay, so let's look at how this, when it, when it inserts the, that number of rows, after it inserts that number of rows, what it's going to do 
is there's another uh, rule that fires when you insert a, uh, a row, and that is to copy the values over. So we insert five rows, or four or three rows in this case, and then for each row, when we insert it, it's actually going to copy the values from the secondary data source as a side effect as a, of, that, of that insertion. So the insertion as a row, the row then has a rule, and that rule copies those three values and decrements the count. So let's just see how that works. Okay, so the preview uh, shows us, first of all, we're going to delete the number of values here. We're going to delete all the rows in the main data source. And we're going to add, we're going to click on this copy using insert. And that what that does is it inserts those three rows and copies them. So it only, we don't have to have the default data in order to get that to work. So that's an example of code, and it's an example, Qrules is an example of a data-driven library where you pass the XPath as a parameter to the rule that you're going to fire. Okay. The final example is web services. Now, web services um, are very important for pulling data in from secondary data sources, databases, SharePoint lists, user profile service, those kinds of things. And whenever you do that, you're going to have a query and you may have a submit. You don't want to hard code those queries. If you hard code the query, um, what happens is, is if the, if the data changes, um, it's very hard to change the query. Um, so what you want to do is you want to have a query that, um, that is flexible. It's either in a rule or in some way that you can easily, um, and, and with submit it's even more pronounced because with submit, you're submitting to a database or to some other um, line of business application. If you submit your form, and you submit every single field as a separate parameter, when that form changes, guess what? That web service needs to be changed. And that's, that's a bad nightmare. Um, typically, what Microsoft suggests, this is the best practice, is to have web services. But if you create a separate web service for every InfoPath form template, you're going to have a maintenance nightmare because you'll have 100, 200, 1,000 different form uh, templates for your business processes. Um, as you scale out to use SharePoint, you're going to have many more Forms, forms, form templates, and you don't want to have to create a separate web service for every single one. Rather, you should create one web service for all of them. And, and the example here is is, um, is our Deep Excel web service, which is uh, like QRules, it's a data-driven tool, data-driven design. And what that allows you to do um, is use exactly one web service here with uh, different um, mapping files. So instead of a uh, um, we don't specify the mapping from the XML form into the SQL database. Instead, um, we are just, uh, um, we, you know, the, the web service loads the mapping from a separate resource. It's a data-driven data resource. Let me just show you that real quick. So I have on um, my local machine a version of our web service installed. And the web service comes with an admin tool called the uh, Excel admin tool. And we're going to open that up. It's an InfoPath form. And this form, um, like we saw earlier with the expense report form, this form also has a data-driven design. So it allows us to change the language, English to Japanese. We have Japanese customers, and that changes the labels. Not, not, so, not so interesting for this main page here. But what I want to show you is this uh, expense report sample. This form here um, has a mapping to a database. So if we look at the config for this form, um, you'll see that um, we have a mapping to the database. And this mapping um, specifies uh, the database table. Um, the database is on top here. We're using the QDAB utility database. And then it's got a bunch of tables the uh, report table, the report items, and so forth, right? And then in each table, there's a field. So the left side of this uh, this uh, mapping here is is the SQL database. The right side is the, uh, and I can, of course, change these. I can go in and change the mapping. When I click on these buttons here, it's going to open up the, um, the SQL database I have on my local machine. Of course, it could be on a SharePoint server or whatever. Uh, on the right, uh, what you'll see is you'll see the, the XML path. This is to your form. So once again, I can also specify this by clicking on these buttons here and looking at my 
my schema, my data source tree. You can see that it shows up down below here. This is my expense report form. That's my expense report data source with the items in it and everything. On top, I have some values that um, Excel supports and allow us to um, use these mapping values. Um, but basically, what you see here is that on the left, we have SQL, on the right, we have the XPath. This is a data-driven design. In other words, this data here that specifies the mapping can be changed um, after the fact. And, um, and you can update all the existing forms. So it, it allows you to, to add fields to the form, uh, to change the mapping, um, and you don't have to stop the process. In other words, you just change the mapping on the fly. Maybe your admin comes in after hours, changes the mapping, and then remaps all the forms out there. So once I change my mapping, you can see here I have this, this command to reshred all documents. What that's going to do is it's going to uh, use the, the new mapping for all the, the forms. So it's going to we add, add a field, for example, to our table, um, you know, column for the, the table in SQL. We can we can change it, add a mapping for that column, and then reshred all the documents, and all that data will be extracted. You don't have to resubmit the form. So huge time savings. Um, so that's the example of a data driven design. Once again, just to recap this webinar, we've been talking about four techniques uh, to reduce your costs using data driven design. The first technique is to use a data source that is uh, data driven. It allows for multiple questions or multiple data to be added. And we talked about the quiz form as a great example of that. Then we talked about um, using a data driven design to change the la language text for the view using calculated values. The third thing we talked about was when you do have to add code, don't add it uh, with hard-coded um, XML paths and it. use something that is um, XPath agnostic, you know, that is a common library that you can reuse in all your forms and that reduces your cost. Obviously, you can use QRules. QRules, um, using our, our version of QRules is very inexpensive. You don't even have to hire a developer and we update it for you every quarter and keep you uh, supported if you have any issues. Um, web service wise, you also don't want to create separate web services for every single InfoPath form that you want to submit to SQL, nor do you want to create separate web services for every single query. Um, you don't want to have a hard coded query, you don't want to have a hard code submit, you want to use a generic web service that allows you to specify the query string or the submit mapping using a data file. I didn't show you how the query string mapping works, but it's basically um, DXL supports both the query side and the, the submit side in a data driven way. And that reduces the number of web services you have, reduces the amount of maintenance cost. And that's really it for the, uh, for the demo. We have put these samples out there um, on, our, um, on our site. You should have a link there on YouTube for them. And I want to thank you um, for, the, um, for, for being with me today. I hope you have any questions, feel free to man um, send an email to coursemanager at qdhyber.com. And uh, as always, we appreciate your feedback. Thank you for, for your time.